There are a lot of boss encounters in Tears of the Kingdom, from Master Koga to Demon King Ganondorf to Unibo. These encounters sort of help shape the game and have a lot of impact on the more important parts of the game like temples or the story. Because of how impactful these bosses are, I thought it would be worth talking about all of them in one video. And I do mean all of them, even frocks. But before we start talking about the bosses which are important to the main game, let's first talk about mini-bosses who you can find all throughout the game. The Flux Construct is one of the new bosses that didn't come from Breath of the Wild, and it's pretty simple. There are three variants to the Flux Construct which are designed to be more difficult than the last, but all of them are really easy. This boss isn't fast, and all you have to do is use Alter Hand a couple of times and the fight is over. You can only find level 3 flux constructs in higher areas within the sky, so it's not like new players are going to stumble across them and struggle at all. By the time I did find a flux construct level 3, it was pretty easy. The flux construct is a good way to implement Alter Hand into a boss fight, but even early in the game, this boss fight isn't challenging at all. Still a fun fight though. The most simple boss fight in the entire game is probably the Hinox, who can also be found as the Stalnox. This boss fight is as simple as shooting the Hinox in the head a couple of times and attacking him while he's down. And as much as I can get behind beating people up while they're down, I'm not sure I would say this is a good boss fight. Blue and black Hinoxes aren't any harder to fight and it seems like the only thing setting them apart from regular Hinoxes is that they have more health. Moving on to a slightly more interesting boss, we have the Stone Tallis. The regular Stone Tallis is another simple and easy boss fight where you attack the rock on its head and that's it. But the addition of the Battle Tallis improves this boss by a lot. It isn't even like the Battle Tallis is much different than the Stone Tallis, but it was awesome to see what I thought was a normal enemy camp turn into a small boss fight. The Igneo and Frost Tallis variants are an interesting concept, but in terms of gameplay, they're pretty much the same boss. At the very least, the Stone Tallis bosses are an interesting concept and aren't bad in terms of gameplay. They're also a really good way to farm rupees, since you can sell the gems you get from killing them, and rupees are pretty important. We've also got Mulduga returning for this game, which is a very welcomed return. Mulduga feels more intense than the other mini-bosses we've covered so far, and it's nice to see him return in this game. I mean, in terms of gameplay, this boss isn't anything special, but that soundtrack, oh my goodness. Now it's time to talk about what I believe is the best mini-boss in this entire game, the Gleok. There are four variations of the Gleok, being Fire, Ice, Electric, and King Gleok. The Ice Gleok is the easiest of the four, and the King Gleok is, well, he's King Gleok. The first Gleok I encountered was a Fire Gleok on my way to Rito Village. The slight problem was that I had 5 hearts and didn't have a bow which dealt over 20 damage. But that's just some random mini-boss in the overworld, so it didn't kill me at all. Okay, maybe it did. The obvious weakness that the Gleox have is Keese and Ericata Eyeballs. I think that's how you pronounce it. As long as you have enough Keese Eyeballs, you can continue to shoot homing arrows until the Gleox eventually dies. The Gleox seem pretty hard at first, but after you use homing arrows, it becomes super easy. There was also a two-headed Gleok that was cut from the game, which is pretty weird. Now that we've talked about an actually cool mini-boss, it's time to switch gears and begin talking about Frox. <laughs> Frox is the only mini-boss which is exclusive to one region in the game, being the Depths. Every other mini-boss can be found all across the game. I've made it abundantly clear that Frox is not to be spoken of in any positive way. Frox has no redeeming qualities, and whoever designed this foul creature should have charges pressed against them. The art book for Tears of the Kingdom features this odd ruby frox looking creature who was probably another frox variant who was cut from the game. Even though we've been dealt the misfortune of having frox in the game, at least there's a version of him who's never going to see the light of day. The final mini boss to cover is Unibo. 
Seriously, I completely forgot about this boss until I looked up a list of bosses in the game, which makes a lot of sense since this boss fight is super forgettable. There's nothing to cover when it comes to the gameplay of this boss, but at least we can be grateful that we get to attack Unibo for once, even if it would be better if he were left dead. And that's all for the mini bosses. For the most part, they're pretty easy and short, so there isn't really much to talk about when it comes to them. What's more important is the bosses which are actually fundamentally important to the game, which we're going to talk about now. Even though he's an optional boss, Master Koga technically is considered a main boss, so let's talk about Master Koga. Master Koga has four boss fights, and although they're all different, I think they're similar enough to talk about him as one boss. I actually haven't fought Master Koga for the fourth time yet, since I can't find the Rito Village Chasm, and I'm too stubborn to look it up, so don't take what I'm saying as gospel. The introduction to Master Koga is definitely my favorite of all the bosses, because as per usual, he comes in and it's super dramatic, and it leads into an extremely easy boss fight. None of the fights against Master Koga are particularly hard at all, and the real highlight is the dialogue before the fights. There's unique dialogue with Master Koga if you're wearing the Yiga Clan armor set, which I thought was pretty cool. And even without the bonus dialogue, Master Koga is pretty funny. The next boss to talk about is Kolgera, and I've already mentioned this before, but this is basically my favorite boss in the entire game. In terms of gameplay, it's beyond simple, since all you have to do is attack three areas and the boss dies, but I think the design of the fight makes up for it. Aside from the final boss, there isn't really a boss which feels as important to the game, and honestly, I think this boss fight set my expectations way too high for future bosses. Although soundtrack doesn't matter all that much, the Kolgara soundtrack is my favorite in the entire game and really elevates the boss fight. Even though Dragon Roost Island is the most overplayed Nintendo song ever, it's still cool to see references to other Zelda games within the Kolgara soundtrack. I'm gonna keep it short because I've talked about this boss before, and probably will in the future as well. My favorite boss is obviously the last one, but this is a close second. Moragia is probably the most forgettable main boss, which makes sense since it's just there to show you how to use Unibo's ability and doesn't really do anything. There's no challenge to this boss, and the soundtrack is okay. The design isn't bad, but isn't good either. It's really just there, and there isn't much to say, so we'll leave it at that. The more important boss for the Goron quest line is the Marbled Goma. This boss fight is pretty cool, but it's also beyond easy and doesn't really pose a challenge. Although, I wouldn't say it's as boring a boss fight as Moragia. This part in the Fire Temple where it jumps on the roof and you need to use Unibo's ability is awesome, but the rest of the boss fight is pretty basic. In terms of design, it's not spectacular, but I would say it's pretty cool. I have bias because I do enjoy seeing things come back from old Zelda games, but is there a problem with being biased towards cool things? The one thing I will say is that the Marbled Goma is the best part about the Fire Temple. That might be the lowest bar in the world, but it's a good thing. Anyways, now that we've talked about the bosses that don't suck, it makes perfect sense to darken the mood by talking about Mock to Rock. This boss deserves all the hate it gets, it's kind of bad. In the Water Temple, it's actually not a bad boss fight since the low gravity lets the player shoot arrows and chase it pretty easily, but without low gravity, this is the worst boss fight in the game. This is one of those boss fights where the only difficulty is having enough patience to fight a boring boss for over 10 minutes, just to get an okay reward. I actually have a lot of appreciation for this boss fight, because fighting Mokhtarok a few times will double your attention span, which is pretty useful. There are other long bosses in video games, but they're usually fun because they have a lot of attacks or at least engage in the fight, whereas this boss fight is prolonged because of Sludge going everywhere and the boss running away the whole time. He also looks kinda stupid, but I don't have an issue with that. All things considered, this is the worst boss in the game, so let's move on to a boss that I absolutely love. Let's talk about Queen Gibdo. You thought I was going to talk about a good boss for a second. <laughs> Queen Gibdo is a fantastic second place for worst boss in the game. Queen Gibdo has a lot of similar issues to Mokhtarok, like taking too long and running away a lot. 
but it isn't as bad. The main difference between Mokhtarok and Queen Gibdo is that Queen Gibdo will actually attempt to attack the player and stays down when she gets stunned. Second stage of Queen Gibdo is a lot worse since she summons actual Gibdos to help her out, which makes the boss fight a lot less fun. I don't really like the design of the boss, but the utilization of Riju's ability for the boss fight is the best of any boss, which is a pretty good thing going for it. I don't know who decided to make one of the last final bosses in this battle bots arena, but I appreciate it a lot. This is definitely the most unique setting for any boss in the game, and it's a really interesting arena. The arena doesn't really have an impact on any of the other bosses, except for this one, and it's a very positive impact. And in terms of gameplay, this boss is also pretty good. The boss is very similar to the Meteru construct, and attaches different stuff to its arms, which makes the boss fight feel very unique. This isn't a hard boss by any means, and it's pretty easy to beat this boss without even getting hit, but the gameplay is still pretty fun. Now it's time to talk about the final boss in the game, Ganondorf. I'm gonna talk about each stage of this boss fight separately, since there are four stages to this boss fight. The first stage is really simple and easy. He has a few attacks that can be dodged without even trying, and he doesn't have that much health. This is basically a warm up for what's to come during the boss fight, but it's also pretty fun. Second stage is where it becomes real. Before I start talking about the stage itself, can I just mention how awesome Ganondorf looks? I think I can mention that. The first important thing when it comes to this stage is that Ganondorf gives himself a slight health boost of I think it's like 10%. Ganon's attacks aren't that much harder than before, but he does summon 4 shadow clones who attack the player and the sages. The clones aren't actually that much of a challenge since they don't deal gloom when they hit the player, so even if you do get hit there isn't much of a risk. This stage of the boss fight is probably my least favorite since the clones are nothing more than a distraction and the real Ganondorf is just as easy as before. The next stage of the boss, stage 3, completely removes the clones from the boss fight which turns it back into a 1v1. In terms of gameplay, this is definitely the best stage. Ganondorf is far more difficult now than he was before since he has more advanced attacks and he can even flurry rush the player's flurry rush. Some of stage 3 Ganon's attacks also deal permanent heart loss rather than his previous attacks which could only deal gloom damage. You can cheese this boss by jumping into the air with a bunch of Gibdo bones, which, I mean come on, is pretty lame. Ganondorf should have had some way to deflect or ignore arrows because they do make it really easy to beat this boss. The good news is that if you aren't cheesing the boss, it actually isn't that easy. Stage 3 Ganon is definitely the hardest boss fight in the entire game, which is a nice change of pace from all the other bosses who are pretty easy. The final stage of this boss, Stage 4 Ganondorf, is my favorite boss fight in the entire game. Ganondorf is completely willing to sacrifice anything in order to achieve his goals and turns himself into a dragon. Gameplay wise, this boss is pretty easy and simple since all you have to do is reach a few important points and attack them, a lot like Golgara. This boss fight delivers on that important finale feeling that was completely missing from Dark Beast Ganon in Breath of the Wild, and it's part of the reasoning Tears of the Kingdom has my favorite ending in any game. The part when the Blood Moon comes out and the song starts remixing Zelda's lullaby is some of the most fun I've ever had playing a game. I've conducted a theory which is that nobody has a real opinion on Tears of the Kingdom until they reach this boss fight, since everyone I know who gets to this part of the game changes their ratings drastically. I know I didn't mention the Lionel or Boss Bokoblin, but they technically aren't bosses, and the Boss Bokoblin is just a Bokoblin, but bigger. I know I also didn't talk about the Sludge-like or the Phantom Ganon bosses, but that's mostly because I don't have anything to say about either of them. I, I mean seriously, what am I supposed to say? Wow guys, look, Phantom Ganon is red? <laughs>